Hi, hello everyone, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This is Chua Chingo. Um, I'm actually connected from Beijing, China. Um, I guess um, we. I'm um, sorry um, to be starting a bit late because of some technical errors, but um, we will get started right away now. Um, so let me give you um, a quick overview. Um, this is like um, a seminar of uh, five, six presentations, and the previous one was about. Um, urbanization and growth. Um, and this one in particular, I will discuss urbanization in China and what will be key reform needed in order for China's urbanization in the next 20 years to be more efficient, more inclusive, and more sustainable. Uh, so this will be the main discussion um, for the next 20 minutes that I will go through um, with the slides. So I guess if we could have the slides up. Um, cool. Okay, so let's get started. I guess you guys can see on the screen. Um, what we knew was that actually um, with the rapid economic growth in China, um, that comes with um, the stresses that you know we see today. And I'm going to tell you there are the three main stresses that we found economically, socially, and environmentally. And then in order for China to transform into high-income service-based, innovation-driven um, type of economy, we hope that urbanization in the next two decades will fulfill the goals of economic efficiency and the goals of social equity as well as the goal of environmental sustainability. And what I'm going to tell you that the most important reform that need to take place will be in the three factor markets. So it will be in the market of land, market of labor, and in the market of capital. And capital here we refer to financial capital and public capital, which means public finance reform. So this is you know, um, a one-minute story about what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to go through and show you the stresses that have come from rapid urbanization in the last 20 years. And so at this juncture, China no longer can urbanize in the fashion that it had in the last 20 years. So at this point, what should they do? And we're going to tell them that in order, you know, to urbanize, in a sustainable way um, for the economy to reach a high income and for the society and environment, for society to be stable and environment to be sustainable, you need to fulfill three goals of economic efficiency, social equity, and environmental sustainability. So let's take a quick look at the achievements that are so well known about China's development story of the last 30 years. So this is 1978 of China, and that was Shenzhen that you just saw, and this is 30 years later of a fishing village that had turned into a metropolis. And here is a picture of Shanghai just over two decades ago, and that exact same location now is what we see with all the high rises and the tallest buildings of the world. So we all know that China's rapid um, growth is accompanied with also rapid urbanization. So this spike showed you the economic concentration of production in terms of area. So you can see that they are all concentrated mostly along the coast. And we know that the rapid urbanization or rapid development growth had also brought a lot of social achievements in terms of poverty reduction and, you know, rising um, welfare levels in terms of um, health care outcomes and schooling outcomes of children. And it is well known that the successes have come from abundant labor in China, had come from cheap land, which the government owned. As, which is part of legacy of central planning, and it has very good infrastructure. But we are also seeing strains 
or stresses that I mentioned. So we are seeing that in you know, falling economic efficiency, we shows up in a misallocated use of land, we shows up in the inefficient use of capital. And then the stress that we saw in social equity is the widening disparities, a rising inequality in the society. And lastly, in terms of environmental stresses, we all know about the pollution and environmental degradation that today's China cities all face. So we feel that even though China has phenomenal success in the last 20, 30 years, you know, the same model that had brought them to today middle income uh, status will not be able to deliver for them in terms of economic efficiency or social equity to get to high income, a modern, harmonious society. So then the challenges would be how do you then sustain growth to reach high income while at the same time address the tensions from social inequities and lastly clean up the environment to make sure that its transformation will be sustainable going forward. And we're going to um, we're going to tell you that uh, the findings we had was that the most important reform has to concentrate on the three factor input markets. And I'm going to explain to you how. But let me just stop for briefly to tell you how you know China's success had come about. If we think about you know the last thirty years of transformation. It has come, you know, on the shoulder of global demand on China's manufactured goods. So what what it has been was an export-led growth agenda for China. And the external demand from the world market had put on a lot of discipline, put on a lot of productivity in its manufacturing sector. So what we see today is that the product market in China is liberalized. But within China, the factor input markets are still straddled with a lot of distortions of all kinds, partly because of central planning legacy, um, but partly was also you know, many specific China elements that over the years had exacerbated this distortion. So now, if we are going to think that China's growth engine is going to come more from internal demand and less from external export, then it is important to actually address these distortions in the factor input markets. And, and over, overlaying all this is an important message to the government that, you know, the, the policy mix that they had pursued in the last few decades, um, which is heavily um, uh, government-led and government-driven, is going to be increasingly difficult in order to deliver, you know, in a sophisticated economy. So here, as you see on the slide, is that we are calling for a new role of government, which is that it's not to say that the government has no role at all, but to say that the policy makes between government's role or government interventions and market forces will have to be recalibrated, will, re will have to be reweighted, so that there will be more for the market forces to do some of the more difficult work that the governments are not suitable to do. And we're going to see that more starkly in the three-factor input market. So what do, we, what do I mean by that? So for example, in the area of land reform, in order for us to have the goal of economic efficiency, to have the goal of social equity and environmental sustainability, we need to have a functioning land market. And here, so far in China, one is that it is still much directed and much decided by the government, not only on land use, but also the prices of the use of land, um, meaning how much do you pay for the different usage of, you know, parcels of land. So that's one. The second thing is that um, in the rural land market, for example, 
um, property rights is still not well defined because it is still under collective ownership of that village or that commune. So these are non-market features that have hindered um, how land use evolve over the years. So that's one example of how we think that you know government should step back and let you know the the um, market players get into the marketplace to transact and to decide on what is best for the land use. So this is one important area, and um, the distortions that had come from um, the the land market showed up in how land use has been very inefficient. And what I meant by that was that there was a lot of sprawling in um, in in China China's urban areas. So what that means is that you have a, a huge amount of congestion and pollution costs from that sprawling versus a compactness of a city. So here in this case, it's because the government has relied a lot on the the money or the revenue that comes from leasing land that it has led the expansion of urban areas the physical expansion of uh, urban areas growing very rapidly so here is what what i mean that for example going from one point to another takes you know a vast distance and even greater distance if we think of it in terms of time cost because of congestion so these distortions had been linked with how that has caused urbanization to be not efficient economically. So that's one. And then another thing we saw is that also um, in uh, the land market, the, the use for prime central urban land for industrial uses is too high. So let me give you an example. Say in Seoul, New York City, London, what you saw to be um, the proportion of uh, metropolitan land use to be for industrial use is about like 3 to 5 percent. Whereas in China, we are seeing up to 25 percent of that in industrial use. So this is one area. Another area is the labor market. And here primarily, um, the distortion has stemmed from the restrictive uh, hukou, um, which is a residency quota um, registration system. So this is like in the old Soviet, old Soviet style, the Propiska system, where whoever is born in that place is registered and in a sense tied, and their rights are tied to the place of birth. And then even after many you know, years or decades, say, of a migrant worker, living and working in a city, that person, if that person does not have the, that city's who call or that city's registration, that person is not entitled to the basic amenities and social services in that city. So, so you can see one is how much, you know, um, inequity that creates. Second, you can also see how that is not helping to create you know, um, a consumer class in urban areas, a consumer class from migrant workers, you, you are hindering that development. And third is that you can also see from that one distortion linked to the labor market with this um, tying up one's mobility, that you are also stopping um, the development of a service sector. So this, this, this is the key constraint or key distortion in the labor market. And lastly, we're going to um, talk about uh, what needs to be done in the capital market. And here, the capital, we refer to both the financial capital of the banking sector and, and also the public finance system in China. Because the incentives of how a local government will behave rely heavily on how you know, how public finance is governed. So, for example, how transfers take place from the central government to the subnational governments, or how tax revenue is shared between county governments and provincial governments. All these will determine how each local government will behave towards their residents 
and how they will behave towards incoming migrants. So let me give you a few examples of how um, the public finance system has created distortions that are not helping urbanization to be more efficient and inclusive. So for example, um, the value-added tax in China is collected at the production sites. So that is collected at the factories and it is not collected at the consumption or the destination um, uh, site. So what that means is that if I'm a local government, I would only care to have a lot of factories coming into my jurisdiction because I see factories, I see investors to be the, the revenue generators but I don't see consumers, I don't see migrant workers coming into my jurisdiction to be taxpayers, even though they do pay taxes. So this, for example, is one way that is also linked to why we saw in cities where industrial use should be falling with you know, the, the tractor transformation that you would see more service sector coming into big cities, you still find that about 25% of land use in metropolitan areas in China are devoted to industrial use. So this is also related not only to the land market distortions, but also to the public finance system and how that is, you know, governing the incentives of local governments to behave. So that's one area. Another area is um, the way that local governments have access to land because land in China is state-owned. So the ease of access of local governments to land had, of course, yielded, you know, the, the fantastic infrastructure that China has today. But it has now become a handicap that it has now made it, you know, environmentally not sustainable because in the way that because it's a ge revenue generator for local governments, infrastructures are, you know, are misplaced or misinvested. So we have enough, we have falling efficiency of capital, for example, that I mentioned. We have sprawling in cities. And this is, you know, also related to this public finance system that they rely a lot on land revenue to, as, as, their, as their revenue sources. So if we are going to get rid of these distortions and at the same time get rid of the sources of revenue for these local governments, we need to give them replacement of something else where they could tap into for uh, their tax revenue. And so the whole, you know, theory of tax reforms and all that would come into play. And uh, so I, I had just given you a very brief um, overview of... Um, what we saw to be the 20 year of rapid growth and um, accompanied with, you know, high, um, highly urbanized, high, highly urbanizing rate. And that had brought, you know, of course, a lot of um, uh, achievements like poverty reduction, um, growth, you know, like per capita GDP had multiplied by six times. It had brought, no doubt, a lot of achievements, but it has also created a lot of stresses. One is the stress in the economic efficiency side. As you saw, a lot of sprawling in big cities that certainly doesn't, you know, um, contribute to agglomeration economies. And that had brought also stresses from, um, uh, into the society from the widening disparities that we see. And lastly, it had brought in stresses from the environmental degradation and pollution. So now at this juncture, we think that for them, for China's authorities to um, to tackle this, they need to think of what we, we call the new growth model, which is that you need to have three goals mutually reinforcing each other. And the three goals are that you need to deliver economic efficiency. Second, you need to also provide social equity to the society. And third is your environmental sustainability. And for them to do that, you have to embrace that, you know, there is a whole system of cities of different sizes and they do different things. And lastly, um, what the government needs to do is to step back and recalibrate the policy mix so then 
they would not be so heavy-handed on administrative measures after administrative measures to fix the problem, but instead let market forces do some of the difficult work for an increasingly sophisticated economy. So I'm going to stop here. I, tr I, uh, I on purpose, give many slides and, um, and make um, my presentation brief. So then I thought if you have um, questions, we could perhaps I could clarify and uh, go into detail, um, you know, um, with, with you know, some more information that is also in the slides. But, but because we have an audience um, spanning different continents, and I would just want to not, you know, um, pick up all the time with, with my um, talking. So let me just stop here and, um, and take questions. Okay, uh, I am reading, um, let me see, let me just, I guess you want the PowerPoint and no problem, the PowerPoint, they would write online. Uh, let me start from uh, the chat. It's, I can see that, um, okay, I can see one question I, that it says construction workers are 80%. Um, Okay, so the question was, I can see that construction workers are 80%, so major job opportunity is in the construction sector in China. Um, the response to the question is that, um, no, um, when I say 80% of construction workers, um, I meant that, um, I meant that um, the migrant workers made up 80% of co the construction workers. So it's not that, you know, 80% of China labor force is construction worker. But because that slide, um, it, I'm just saying there are 260 million migrant workers, right? And I was saying that they contributed to greatly to the urban economy. And one of that was that 80% of the construction workers are migrant workers. So that was the clarification. Okay, next is, um, uh, okay, wait, let me see. Uh, okay, there are a lot of questions, uh, requests about the PPT, which is fine, you will get that. Okay, then um, another question came about removing incentives for fragmented law land and low densities. Yeah. Um, actually, let me clarify. I'm not asking for low density, actually. Uh, the pro we are hoping that you... Okay, let me put it another way. For cities, for large metropolises to deliver the benefits of what a large city should do, which is agglomeration economies, you know, productivity gains, learning from one another, you know, all those IT-driven type of idea-generated growth, you actually need metropolises that are very dense. So I am not suggesting low density. When I say very dense, it does not have to be congested. Or polluted. When I said density, a density, I meant that the production, the value added in that surface area is extremely high, which means what you do economically is very valuable. And in cities, in compact cities like the New York City, London, or even Tokyo, you can deliver this type of economic density without that much of congestion. In China, big cities are not dense enough. When you see a lot of people, when you see a lot of cars, that are not equivalent to density. That are just crowdedness. That are just congested. When we say it economically dense, it actually, you know, has a, a different meaning, which is like it has to be compact. And which means people can walk, you know, public transportation is very well connected, agglomeration economies is flourishing, um, the service sector thrives. So, so I hope I clarify. In, and in the last 10 years, the cities, um, in China have been sprawling, um, sprawling. That means, you know, you have to get from one point to another by car and driving a vast distance. That's sprawling. That's not compact. And that is not dense. And, Density in China cities has been falling, and the reason is because of the sprawling nature 
that cities had developed in China, and that is the problem. Uh, I hope I'm clear. Um, so let me read on about the other questions. Okay, with the pursuit of productivity and efficiency, will the job will the government allow SO to leave and let it fall? Okay, um, let me tell you that um, uh, SOEs, the statement. And become even stronger. Been worried. It, it has been a worrisome development, and as you can imagine, also during these ten years of rapid growth, and with with the rising power of state-owned enterprises, reform in that sector of the state-owned enterprises, which tend to be plagued by inefficiency and you know lower productivity, will be difficult, understandably, because of vested interests, and therefore. We think that fundamentally, if they do, if the governments do not first and foremost tackle reforms in the factor markets, then it would be, you know, it would be impossible to tackle the state and enterprises. So put it another way, if you start to address the distortions in the factor input markets, then a lot of the problems would have been resolved, because right now. The distortions had given the state-owned enterprises an edge, an advantage, you know, to to um, to compete, because the distortion in the in in the factor markets are not creating, are tilting, are not making, you know, the playing field is are not leveling the playing field. Therefore, private capital, domestic or international, can't easily compete with state-owned enterprises. So what we don't uh, comes in head on to say do this do that for state owned enterprises, we think the fundamental distortion had all been created or had remained in the factor input markets that need to be removed. Okay, let me see. Uh, the presenter refers in several slides to public service delivery in Chinese cities. So that raises my curiosity on the status of public services, water, electric waste. Is this all well taken care of? Okay. I guess um, I guess data is now quite easily available, but maybe not at the city level. Um, but just one thing: um, 
is public service delivery, of course, improve with you know the rising income levels of China. There's no doubt. That's one. Two is that, but we think that for a lot of、um, Chinese local governments, which mean provincial governments or city governments or county governments, they have been more concerned with economic growth in the last 25 years than actually with delivering services to their citizens. And we certainly hope that with the reform in public finance, you know that incentive will heavily switch, you know, towards government that should deliver quality public services to its residents and not so much be involved in economic production. When I say economic production, I'm talking about,、um, you know, governments actually、um, working together with. The state-owned enterprises, and they own partly、um, in economic production, whether it's manufacturing or services sector. Okay, next question:、uh, What should what would be the fixed asset investment in the next year as percentage of GDP? Okay,、um, we know that you know、um, the the fixed asset investment has been growing、um, at about you know in the teens. Um, I mean, it has kind of tapered in the last few quarters, but、um, investment,、uh, infrastructure investment, is still a large、um, proportion、um, for GDP, and it's still,、um, you know, driving GDP. I think the government is aware, one, that it is okay、um, to settle at a lower growth rate, and I think that is a huge recognition. Um, on the top leadership side, about the need for quality and sustainable growth, which is a good thing. And two is that、um, I think, given that they are also aware that the engine of growth has come from asset、uh, infrastructure investments, that they need, you know, they need to accept that、um, you know、um, infrastructure investment would have to slow down. We're not saying negative; we're saying slow down, slower growth. Um, so that that is something I think、um, the authorities, you know, had come to accept that, and so、uh, it, there's no question. It's just that how much of a slowdown, to what extent, you know, the pace of slowing down is acceptable, and given、um, the huge、um, component、uh, that growth comes from investments directly, that you know that there is, you know, there's that worry at times that. You know when growth starts to slow, like exports growth starts to slow, or, or consumption growth has not picked up, then they start to worry whether they need to have another stimulus or supportive measure to boost investment. Okay, all right. Next question、uh, on the how: How can the World Bank or other external actors support this reform process across each of these areas?、Um, how? Okay.、Um, I mean, there are many ways because there are a lot of things to be done、um, in this and this on this reform agenda, and、um, I'm only pointing out only the three sector input markets, which to me is the most critical. But during the third plenum decisions、um, of the government, they had actually you know slated over two dozen reform areas. So the Chinese government、um, are very ambitious to actually reform its economy. And I think there are just many ways,、um, you know, from all the way from the multilateral side, the World Bank,、um, to even、um, investors that can help prod or push、um, towards, you know, greater reform、um, in China. I mean, there's, there's just so much of it that I、um, like, you know. But okay, since you asked the how, I, I don't want to evade the question. So, for example.、Um, Let me、uh, pick a few.、Um, one would be that,、um, say, okay, in the land market reform area, there are there are many little things that one can do, starting from say regulatory reform, you know, how you zone, how you regulate zoning, and how do you、uh, dictate land use, and then in the land reform area as well, you、um, need to discuss how are you going to tax land and how land transactions are going to take place. And and first and foremost, before any of this will be effective, will be well-defined property rights, which is still not the case in rural land ownership. So that's one area. So then now let me、um, go to say, you know, the public finance, public capital reform area.、Um, there are so many good examples of how you know different governments had 
reform its own um, uh, fiscal uh, system, that I think they can offer to China many stories and, and lessons. So these are another area, specifically. Uh, let me move on to the next one, uh, which is how is uh, public participation more encouraged? Um, well, uh, we know that actually um, China cities are very wired. People are online. Um, so I think it has been um, phenomenal growth in that participation, you know, in the media um, or in, in, in on, um, online. Um, and for, you know, a communist country, I think it is uh, remarkable that that growth that we saw. And um, I think this will be um, a discussion in and of itself um, um, on this public participation, which I actually know very little about and won't delve, delve too much on. Okay, next question. Um, considering that China will consume more domestically, what would be that percent of GDP? Okay, right now the consumption, domestic consumption as a percent of GDP is very low, and we're talking about like, you know, 35 or 35% or so. And uh, we look at comparable level of development for Korea, for Japan, for Taiwan, for Hong Kong, and, uh, you know, they are at a much larger uh, level. And and so we, we do think that it will age, you know, it will slowly, you know, go up in terms of its share in the GDP of domestic consumption. But I don't think there's any ma magic number that, you know, one should think it can optimally settle on, whether it's 65, 50. I, don't, I do not think there is such a number. And um, I think it is, it is just that the direction that is moving away from investment-driven towards consumption-based uh, uh, growth is, is a good direction, that's one. And I think more importantly is that the government needs to do more to make sure that the underlying sources for consumption are there. And what are the, what are the underlying sources for domestic consumption? One would definitely be an integrated market um, that would be important for Ch in China, which we don't see. Two, you also need labor mobility, which we still don't see that much, even though it is not really allowed, but people still move around. But, you know, this, this all help. And um, the mobility and also the way that, you know, every resident, every citizen is treated equally in every place, that is very important because that is, kind of a fundamental step to creating a middle class. And we know that the global middle class in China is extremely small in terms of percentage of uh, its population. It's about 17%, one seven of its total population. And when you look at Korea, Japan, other middle income countries in Asia, when they were at the same level of per capita GDP as China, the global middle class share of its populations are much, much higher. So what that means is that um, disposable incomes of household has not grown, you know, as fast in the last decades. Um, so one key source for domestic consumption growth would have to be making sure that disposable income of households or labor share in GDP is growing and growing rapidly. So, so this is this is important um, in order for us to shift towards a consumption-driven economy. Okay, next question. Um, by Levy. Okay, uh, what is the direction of the reform of the state-owned enterprises, especially in those monopoly firms? Yeah. Okay. Um, my reading is the following that. During the Zhu Rongqi administration, there has been, you know, a conscientious uh, push to separate, you know, the state, the government, from the production side. And there is even a, a phrase that said, you know, we would like to advance private capital and we would like uh, state-owned enterprises to retreat, to step back, to give room to private investment, private capital. 
But we also know that in the last 10 years, that was reversed because, you know, there has been, for whatever, I mean, for many reasons, but one is that because of lack of reform, um, that we have seen the advancements of state-owned enterprises crowding out private capital in the last 10 years. Now, what I see to be the administration's measure is neither to say, is, is neither of, uh, okay, remember in the Jurongi um, era, there was a conscientious push to say, let's advance private capital and retreat public capital. And last 10 years, we knew the opposite happened, that actually state-owned enterprises had advanced and private capital had retreated. But now the way I see it is that the administrating come to accept that, okay, SOEs will stay because they are now so big. But we are going to make it as possible a level playing field as we can for private capital to come in as well. So everybody competes on the same ground. So that is the direction I'm seeing. But whether in reality that happens is another matter. But I do think, and I do want to give credit to the administration for trying to make it a level playing field for private capital, domestic or international, can come and compete head to head with the state owned enterprises. So that, that has been, you know, seemed to be the policy direction and the intentions of the administration. It is just that I don't know whether in reality that will happen. So that's the answer to your question. And next one is, um, will, um, will supporting privatization help in making government more efficient? Yeah, definitely, of course, of course. Privatization is just meaning bringing more competition, you know, letting, you know, the, the aging industries and the floundering industry die. It's creative destruction. So it's privatization is definitely... Um, you know, a powerful, uh, a powerful boost for efficiency, but uh, but I'm not sure. Um, privatization is, um, you know, is 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 a term or is a is a process that the authorities um, see to be something suitable, you know, for China's development. Um, but I think they do have the intention to try to bring in elements you know, that replicate competition or, you know, private sector. So there's no doubt there is that intention. Um, but I'm not sure outright privatization um, is something they would embrace. Next question. What are the steps that local governments are doing, could do to shift or could do to shift from development model that's heavily focused on infrastructure to the one that I propose? Yeah. Um, that's right. Very, uh, very good question. So, what, what it is, right? Um, so, it's uh, the the thing is this. Right now, um, we know that the product market in China is liberalized, completely liberalized. How did that come about? The product market is liberalized because the discipline or the external demand, the global demand, requires that. It it, it, it leaves China no choice but to liberalize its product market in order to compete internationally, to tap into global market, right? So that's what happened in the last 20 years. So, but they could still do that despite the distortions in the factor input markets because that is not tradable. The factor input markets of land, of labor, of capital, they're all within China. But we think that now comes the time, now comes the crunch time. That if you don't address all the distortion in your factor input markets, you are going to have a lot of challenges. You meaning, you know, the China development model. So I would say start from there. Start from addressing all these distortions in the factor markets. And I already give many specific examples in each of the factor markets what could be done. And it, it, there are a lot of things to be done, actually, in each of the factor markets. Not only there are a lot of things to be done, they are all not easy to do. So it, it would take a lot of political will and, um, and a lot of, um, you know, pains to actually do a good job to even address half of the distortions that are now there. So, again, the focus should be factor market uh, reform because factor inputs are not easily 
reallocated in China. That's why we don't see an integrated domestic market like we see in the United States. And we don't see labor mobility from one place to another. And similarly, we haven't seen that capital can flow anywhere that it wishes. Okay, next question. Um, Okay, please send a PowerPoint, please send a PowerPoint, sure, we will do that. What about the urban model? I thought China was doing a lot of city planning. Is there a way to develop a city model with defined extensions and density, not just talk about compact, but to say what compact means? Yeah, that's right, very good question, yes, of course. No, China has done, of course China has a lot of city planning. Um, they have huge institutes, institutions doing that. Um, but I think um, the way that China plans um, its cities is still very much um, a mechanistic way. You know, they drew up the maps, and if you look at the urban master plans of the metropolises versus the smallest towns, they all look identical, just about. Okay? But that, that is not, that, that, that should not be the case. Metropolises should do things that metropolises should deliver that agglomeration economy. So in the jargon of the literature will be urbanization economy, how you incubate ideas, how you, you know, um, incubate new industry by, you know, generating, by sparkling new ideas. And then for the little towns, what you do is you want scale economies, say, in factories. You want scale economies in distribution center for agriculture produce. So for different type of cities or different size of cities, they should do different economic functions. Then you also have some of those medium-sized cities where they cluster and say, for example, automobile cluster. Um, you know, they have specialization of all the different uh, in industries, you know, clustering in um, together uh, in a cluster of cities where uh, it could be automobile industry, could be related to um, a textile or others. But it, you see, so different cities should do different things. So that's one. So we already see that the the city planning of China has still been very much a Soviet style uh, type of central planning style. So it's very much mechanistic. And if you look at the master plans across different type of city, they're very similar. So that's one problem. So the, the the important thing is to actually change that mindset, but also to encourage them to think of it as okay, what 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 type of cities are you planning? Are you planning a metropolis or are you planning a medium-sized city? Are you planning a small town or are you planning uh, an even smaller town? So first they have to decide which and what type of cities you know, they are working on or they are planning. Second, then they have to realize what government, in reality, cheap land prices used to be very important to attract money and resources for development. However, today it becomes harder and harder uh, to rely on this land revenue. What will, be, what will be good choices for the government to make sure that it still develops? Okay. Um, so this, this is a, um, a, big, a big question. So first of all, I think China's authorities have to decide whether, you know, they are willing to separate the functions of government into providing services and producing economic goods. And in all market economies, government only deliver public services and the private sector deliver economic goods, okay? But in China, that has been, that's a big mix. The government do both. So I think a fundamental question to ask is, are they willing to, you know, distinct these two um, functions? And then it's because, because the, the government is not supposed to deliver economic development. They're supposed to just facilitate with good regulatory framework and then to get to, to in, and let inv investors come if they so wish. But not to be fully uh, intervene in the production or in the investments part, which is the case in China. So I think, I think one, in, as, as we're reforming the public finance system, I think one needs to think about how willing or whether China has reached the maturing stage of willing to separate service provision from economic production um, in the role of the government. So let me just stop here. Thank you.